Hello and welcome back to the channel. You've joined myself, Dr. James Gill, for another medical video. I've actually been joined by another doctor, but not a medical doctor. We've got Dr. Alice Mace here today. And, well, you're not a medical doctor. What sort of doctor are you? No, so I, I'm a dentist, uh, so I look at the mouth. So, how, how you know, you've, you've come to medical school. Why, given you already have a full, proper job and career? Um, yeah, so... If we're going to go to my career in general, so I qualified in 2020 from Newcastle. Um, I did my foundation year in a practice in Stanley, which is a little town in County Durham. Uh, and then I moved to the dark side and worked in oral and maxillofacial surgery. Uh, so dealing with facial traumas and uh, severe dental infections, facial deformities or cancers, things like that. And then I worked in the northeast for two years in that, so in Newcastle and Sunderland and really enjoyed working in it and found it really interesting. Um, but to be a consultant in oral and maxillofacial surgery, it's the only specialty that you have to be dual qualified in. So you have to do a medicine degree and a dental degree. So I'm back at medical school doing my medicine degree now. So basically when it comes to IQ Smackdown, she's got me licked <laughs> quite considerably. So I'm gonna try very hard not to make a fool of myself here. So you've, you know, you've joined us today to talk about some you know, uh, dental myths, which actually I think is a great thing. There's so often I see patients come to me with dental problems and actually I don't know how I can help them a lot of the time. So what, you know, what sort of things do you come across regular that you wish you could change people's knowledge on? Yes, yeah, so there's lots and lots of dental myths out there. Um, so I thought we could start from the most basic and work our way up. Um, so the most basic being how many times a day should you brush your teeth? Mm, I, twice? Yeah, great. So yeah, twice is what we recommend. Um, so ideally once in the evening, that's the most important one. Uh, and then once at any other time of day, preferably around breakfast, either before breakfast or about half an hour after breakfast. Why is the evening one most important? Because I'd have thought that the one in the morning was just largely so I'm not gassing everybody during the day. Yeah, so it is a common misconception, um, but the one in the evening is the most important because when you sleep, your mouth gets really dry and you have bacteria that sit on your teeth. So that's plaque that you might have heard of. And those bacteria will sit there overnight and then they'll metabolize and produce their waste products, which for them is acid. And that will sit on the teeth and eat them away. So what you want to do before you go to sleep is brush away as many of those bacteria as possible. So then they're not sitting on your teeth overnight, producing all that acid. Okay. So, you know, you said so brushing twice a day. Could I, you know, make that even better and, you know, brush multiple times during the day? Um, you could do. What you might find, though, is if you brush too much, you can actually cause um, what we call abrasion cavities, so where you brush away actual tooth tissue. That would have to be if you were brushing very, very hard, lots and lots of times a day. But we recommend just the twice a day is enough. Okay. Well, that's, you know, I'll definitely stay with the, the twice a day, certainly. Well, so frequently uh, I'll get patients come in to me and they'll say, oh, you know, I, I've got toothache, you know, I need to get antibiotics, I can't get to see my dentist. Mm. Now, as a GP, you know, I'm told I'm not medically legally covered to provide dental care. So often I say to those patients, you know, go speak to your dentist about it. And they grouse because it's, you know, they can't easily get an appointment. Same way as getting any medical appointment is difficult. Mm. But... I also have people say, oh, you know, just, you know, be play fair, give them the antibiotic. You're actually a dentist. What should I do in that situation? Yeah, so it's a really tough one because when people come to you, you want to be able to help them. Um, but if someone just has toothache, and when I say just toothache, obviously it's an awful pain to have. But if they don't have any facial swelling, if they're not unwell in their self, if they don't have any signs of sepsis, there's actually no indication for antibiotics for toothache on its own. Um, there was a big kind of evidence base behind that um, from the Cochrane Collective who did a big meta-analysis and showed that yeah, there's no evidence behind antibiotics for toothache and with resistance as well. What we want to be avoiding is giving people more antibiotics than they need. So if we don't have to give them, we shouldn't. Absolutely, Sal. I'll keep on pushing them your way then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. In terms of the things that you see people doing to their teeth when they, they think that that's a good thing, you've just mentioned about you know, brushing excessively. What's you know, one of the things that you, you really like to help educate people to try and stop them doing? Yeah, so I think one of them is with mouthwashes. So the main rule with brushing your teeth is we say spit, don't rinse. 
So toothpaste itself has fluoride in, um, and so does mouthwash. But toothpaste has a much higher concentration. So it's got 1,450 parts per million of fluoride in, is the regular one that you can buy. And you want that fluoride to sit there on your teeth and work on the teeth and strengthen them. If you're rinsing your mouth out immediately afterwards, either with water or with mouthwash, you're actually washing away all of that fluoride and all of that good stuff that's in the toothpaste. It means it can't work as well. So what we say is if you want to rinse with mouthwash, either do it before you brush or half an hour afterwards, or use it after meals and it's fine then. But just spit out after you brush. Don't rinse with anything. Hold on, you say it's fluoride. I'm, I'm sure I've seen videos saying fluoride is going to grow me an extra head and it's, you know, it's, you know, make me a communist. Isn't fluoride the devil? No, absolutely not. Um, so fluoride is actually really beneficial for teeth. Um, it helps strengthen the enamel that's there. So teeth have three layers to them. So you've got enamel on the outside, dentine in the middle, and you've got the nerve that sits on the inside. And that enamel is that protective coating that helps strengthen teeth. What that fluoride does is it helps strengthen that enamel, which then decreases your risk of decay. Um, the only risks that fluoride pose is if someone's under three and they eat a lot of it. So if your child gets into your toothpaste tube and eats a lot, there is a risk of something called fluorosis. Do they glow in the dark? They don't glow in the dark, no. Um, but otherwise, it's generally fairly safe. Okay. Um, in terms of myths, etc., somebody once told me that um, because my, my dental, dent, my teeth aren't that great. If you've got an early cavity, the fluoride can actually prevent and reverse that decay, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So if you see your dentist and you're perceived to be at higher risk of getting decay, you might be prescribed a higher dose of fluoride. So um, either 2,500 parts per million or 5,000 parts per million of fluoride, which can really help with halting that decay in its tracks if there is some or preventing more forming. What you might have when you go to the dentist as well is a varnish, which is an even stronger strength of fluoride painted onto your teeth, which helps strengthen that enamel even more. Fantastic. So it definitely sounds like you know, being anti-fluoride is quite a conspiracy theory, rather. Absolutely, yeah. Now, you just mentioned that your teeth has got three layers. We've got the enamel, we've got the dentine, and then the nerve. Staying with toothpaste and the like, can you know, these uh, toothbrushes that reduce sensitive teeth actually penetrate that far into a tooth? Yeah, so there are sensitive toothpaste that exist out there and they do actually work fairly well. So how sensitivity works is you have that nerve that sits on the inside and it has little tendrils that sit in the dentine. And it sits in little tubes and is normally covered by that enamel so nothing can get to it. In sensitivity, what happens is some of that enamel is worn away, either because it's at the gum line and it's been brushed away or it just hasn't formed in the first place. And what happens is those little tubes with the nerves in are exposed. So every time you have something really cold or potentially when you touch it, it's really sensitive. So what the toothpaste do is aim to block those holes and then prevent those stimuli getting to that nerve, and which helps the sensitivity. There are lots of brands out there that you can pick. It's just finding which one works best for you. Fair enough. Okay, so staying with that, you know, you said the little holes and the space between the teeth and all of that. Let's be fair, flossing's a pain in the neck. Can't I just vigorously swirl with mouthwash? That'll get between the teeth, won't it? Um, not necessarily. Um, the best thing to do is to floss or use the little brushes, the little interdental brushes between your teeth. If you think each tooth sits together and there's contact with the one next to it, so they sit together quite tight, when you brush your teeth, you can only really brush the front, the back and the tops of the teeth. You can't brush between them. Um, so what the flossing helps to do, or the little brushes, is to get rid of any bacteria that's built up between the teeth. You can either use floss, the string, or in the little floss picks, or you can use the brushes to really help get rid of that between your teeth. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of the stuff that we can buy at the supermarket is actually there to do us good. Yeah. Are there products that we can buy in the supermarket shelves you wish we couldn't? Yeah, so I think one of the things is charcoal toothpaste. Huh? But hold on, loads of brands have got a charcoal toothpaste and it's going to make my smile 50 times better, isn't it? So as soon as you use it, it might look a little bit whiter because anything looks whiter if you put a black background next to it. <laughs> but with charcoal toothpaste, it is actually really abrasive. So what it can do is wear away that enamel surface of the tooth and expose the dentine. That dentine is more yellow in colour, 
So if you think if you've worn away the thing that sits over the top of it, you've got more yellow shining through. So then you've lost some enamel, which is bad because you've got more risk of sensitivity and your teeth potentially look more yellow, which is the opposite reason to why you're using the charcoal toothpaste in the first place. OK, so I'm going to double check what's in the cabinet when I get home. Yeah. <laughs> now, anything that makes my teeth more sensitive is an absolute no-no as far as I'm concerned. Mm. OK, so we're not going to be buying any more um, charcoal-based uh, toothpaste. Is there anything else that you're particularly you know, opposed to on those shelves? I think the only other thing really is toothpicks. Um, for cleaning between your teeth, as we just said, floss and the little, little brushes are much better than toothpicks. Um, with toothpicks, you've got a risk that A, you might slip, you might stab yourself in the gums, you might tear them, and you might even get bits of wood stuck in your gums. So they're not very effective at getting rid of that bacteria between your teeth, and they might actually cause you harm. I'd never thought about trying to clean my teeth as a high-risk activity. Yeah. OK, that's a new one. That's a new one. Gosh. OK, I'm going to thread that on your side then. Is there you know, a particular dental myth that you, know, you really wish that people didn't hold on to, something that actually stops them you know, getting good health? Yeah, so I think one that's quite topical at the moment is um, going to Turkey to have your teeth done. Um, we're seeing quite a lot with more and more influencers going to Turkey and promoting turkey teeth is what we call them, who have had this full, full mouth of veneers, um, and come back and promoted the service that they've had um, and said it's the best thing that's ever happened to them. What we're finding is that it's not. So when people go to Turkey for these veneers, that's not what they're getting. So what veneers are is they're a thin porcelain covering that sits over the top, tops of your teeth and makes them look better. And they require very minimal preparation and they don't really remove that much tooth tissue at all. What we're finding is that patients who've gone to Turkey for these veneers have actually had a full mouth crowns fitted. I was about to say, where's the inverted commas from? Gosh. Yeah. So yeah, so what, what a crown is in comparison to a veneer is it's essentially like a hat that sits on top of the tooth. And if you think about your teeth at the moment, there's not much space to get a hat to fit on them. So you have to prepare the teeth down to get it to fit. But unlike a veneer, it's a very, very high prep thing to have a crown done. Teeth don't really like having that done to them either. So then there's a risk that that tooth might actually die off as a result of it. So they're having these full mouth of crowns done and then they come back to the UK and then the issues start where the teeth start to die off. But then because they've had the treatment done abroad, a lot of UK dentists don't want to treat these patients because they don't know what they've had done, which is fair enough. But then your only option is to go back to Turkey to have them treated which isn't ideal. It really sounds like someone's trying to get a, a, a small way of improving things and make things potentially catastrophically worse. Yeah, absolutely, especially kind of looking longer term, because if these teeth do require root canal treatment, that's obviously not very pleasant for the patient. And there have been cases where someone's come back from Turkey and they've required a whole mouth of root canal treatment. So every single tooth in their mouth has required root canal treatment which obviously isn't ideal, especially when their previous state before they went to Turkey was the teeth was absolutely fine. Looking further in the future as well, crowns only have a lifespan of about 10 years. So if we look 10 years in the future, all of these crowns will need replacing. So that's that expense of going to Turkey doubled again. And then when you prepare for a new crown, you have to remove more tooth tissue. So then there's less tooth there again. Again, increased risk of root canals. Fast forward 20 years from that initial appointment, again those crowns might need replacing again. There's less and less tooth tissue less th left each time. And then, so you're looking at potentially ending up losing all of your teeth because of something you did when you were 20 to improve their appearance. Okay, hold on there, playing devil's advocate, you know, we are medical colossi, you know, technologically wondrous, you know, beings now in the West. Does that matter? Can't I just have an artificial tooth put in? Yeah, so there are things you can do to fill in the spaces between teeth. Um, you can do bridges for if it's just a small amount of teeth replacing, which require preparing a tooth in front or behind um, to stick that false tooth in. You can do dentures, which are teeth on a plate that you remove in and out of your mouth. And then there are implants as well, so little metal screws that we screw into the jaw and then put false teeth on top. But they're surely as good as my normal tooth, aren't they? Um, not quite. So there's no real way of replicating normal teeth 
with anything that we can provide prosthetically. Implants are kind of what we call the gold standard for replacing teeth, but they still have their flaws. You can't feel the way you bite into things as well with implants, so you lose that kind of sensation of biting into stuff. And then implants are also susceptible to similar diseases that teeth get, so if you don't look after them, there's still a risk that they might fail. And they're really expensive. Gosh, okay. I think that might be a good opportunity to bring it to a close. I think yeah. I've got, I think I've got a, uh, a plane flight, a uh, plane to cancel. Um, okay, is there any other particular myths and things you think would be worthwhile to wrap up with today? Uh, I think just the main point of this video is teeth are really important. We could go on all day about how important they are. And I mean, I studied them for five years and there's still stuff that I don't know. And you're constantly learning, but there are loads and loads of myths out there. So if anyone did have any myths that they wanted to ask or questions, feel free to leave them in the comments uh, and we can try and get back to them. And to be honest, I think that's a really good you know, point for you guys at home. Um, this has been a, a trial with ourselves, you know, having a, a, a dentist with us and you know, allowing me to learn things I didn't know. If you'd like us to do a greater series with this you know, um, and seeing what other dental issues and things that we can approach, please you know, shout out to the comments and we'll see what we can do. Well, with that, I think we'll say cheerio and we'll see you in the next one. Tadjabai. Bye.